good evening or morning or afternoon or whatever time you're in. Um, it's always interesting when you engage with people all over the world in terms of time zones. But it's really great to welcome you. Uh, big thanks for supporting us through Patreon and uh, helping us share this message of unconditional love. Um, it's amazing that God is doing such an amazing awakening, touching people's lives and bringing us into a realization of who he is. And that's sort of deconstructing a lot of who we thought he was from the religious constructs that we may have grown up with. Um, again, I'm just going to go and start with sharing some posts and memes that I've seen during the last month and some of my comments on them. Um, and I think this indicates, again, that more and more people are awakening and the Grace Awakening Network is really beginning to expand with more and more people sharing um, the sort of the good news of God's inclusion and unconditional love. Um, this is a, a quote from David Bentley Hart, who is a sort of, um, he's, he's an interesting looking character, big long beard, um, a sort of theologian. Um, but he, he says this, apocatastasis, which is the word for restoration, uh, literally means restoration of all things, and all things would seem to include all things. I look forward to a glorified triceratops. Now, I think he's probably a little bit tongue in cheek, but I get what he's saying. Don't limit all things to only people. It means all things. And that means all things that God has created will find a restored place within creation itself. Here's a quote from Steve McVeigh. You are not undeserving of divine love. Neither are you deserving of it. The very idea of deserving is a categorical error. Imagine your own children constantly confessing to you how undeserving they are of your love. You wouldn't hesitate to say deserve? Question mark, exclamation marks. What are you talking about? You are my child. Is God less loving towards his children than we are? Simply accepting divine love, that is the grace walk experience. We don't have to work for it it is ours because of who god is um, and who he has made us to be as his children here's a, a quote from mario andrade um christ in all a trinitarian perspective i found this quote receiving jesus does not cause his life to enter from somewhere outside us it awakens us to the reality of his presence already within we're no longer blind to the truth of who he truly is as our source of life and who we are as children of God. And I think this is a really, really important thing to note. And it is the heart of the true gospel that God is not outside of us trying to come in. He's inside of us trying to awaken us to that fact. And Paul, who preached a lot to the Gentiles in the early church, Paul describes his own realization experience and his commission described in Acts as a heavenly vision. And in Galatians 1.15, it says, when he who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, called me through his grace. And again, that is uh, our original identity and Paul's and his origin as a child of God. And that God was trying to unveil that he had a destiny and a calling within that relationship uh, but he was resisting that and we know he was kicking against it because he was self-righteously following his own religious ideals um, and that's what most people do in some way or another um, and this is what it says through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me not outside of me trying to get into me not on a door outside of me knocking to come in but a door on the inside of me asking to be let out and then he his, this is the heavenly vision he goes on to say though that uh, so i might preach him in the gentiles now if you read that in any english translation other than the new living uh, the new um translation which is a literal translation it says i might preach him among the gentiles which gives the understanding that paul was going out into the gentile world among the gentiles preaching god's grace and he was preaching god's grace but god's grace was a message of inclusion that the gentiles already had jesus in them and that was the message that paul sought to preach 
And the Mirror Bible um, says this of Galatians 1, 15, God's eternal love dream separated me from my mother's womb. His grace became my identity. Now, that's a beautiful way of saying it, a very poetic way of saying it, but it is the original Greek language in which it was basically describing God's eternal purpose for us and for us, Paul, as an individual, but each of us could say the same that God has chosen and separated me from my mother's womb. His grace, his divine enabling ability became my identity. And verse 16, this is the heart of the gospel that I proclaim. It began with the unveiling of his son in me, freeing me to announce the same sonship in the masses of non-Jewish people, which is what is described as the Gentiles. So the same sonship. And that is the message that we carry to the world who are living in lost identity, often broken, hurting, pursuing their lost identity in many different ways, that actually they are already sons of God. They just don't know it. And he is looking to reveal it to them um, by including them in what Jesus has done, not excluding them because of their behavior. Another quote, the lost sheep was not saved because it repented or came to faith. And of course, the lost sheep is synonymous in the story of us. Um, all it had to do to be saved was to be lost. Being lost triggered the shepherd to save it and bring it home. Now, that is the reality of what the gospel is all about. Everyone is saved because Jesus saved the world. But people don't know that they're lost. So they don't know that they're saved. And the reality is we need to help them see that they are already saved from God's perspective. But God wants them to understand that. So repentance, faith, whatever way you describe repentance in the Latin, obviously, it means repentant. Um, and obviously, in the Greek, it means to agree with God. Now, to agree with God is that we're saved and that he has come to save us from our still lost identity. Um, Baxter Kruger um, from a ministry called Perichoresis. The biblical story is not about an angry God finding a way to be satisfied, which is penal substitution atonement. The biblical story is about the Father, Son and Spirit determined to bring us into being and then bring us into their circle of shared life, relationship, union. That is God's desire and that is what God wants all of us to become aware of. Another quote this time from John Crowder, a variety of different quotes from different people. Salvation is not a commodity, but a person. You did nothing to gain him and you can do nothing to lose him. This is all about his finished work, not about what we do or don't do, but actually realizing this amazing salvation belongs to us is something that we're looking to share with people so they can come into that experience of it now this is from a group called grace gaze mindset of the day old law mindset i am included in god's family but those that don't believe are excluded from god's family new grace mindset before creation all people were included in his family as beloved sons and daughters and through the finished work god made all people right with him forever and again Old Covenant, New Covenant and the mindsets can't be mixed. And I was taught in my upbringing to mix those mindsets. And therefore, I wasn't living in the fullness of the New Covenant because there was a mixture of Old Covenant perspectives that I was living under. So I'm going to just give you 10 better covenant theological principles that may help un in our understanding of the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant and what Jesus came to do in fulfilling everything in him. So number one, Jesus' birth fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant. And that covenant, as we'll see later, was to bring blessing to the world. Two, Jesus' death created the new covenant. So he entered into our death, our lost identity, overcame it, so that this new covenant in his love could be at work. Three, the new covenant is between the father and the son. None of us made a covenant with God. If we did, we could break it. 
But Jesus made a covenant with the Father, the new covenant in him, and therefore he will never break it. And he has included all of us in the benefits of that new covenant by grace, not works. Number four, Jesus's ascension and enthronement in heaven. And that's recorded actually on the day of resurrection uh, prophetically in the book of Daniel, chapter seven, I think, records that Jesus came to the ancient of days, received the kingdom and then gave the kingdom to the saints of the most high, which is what he did in the upper room when he came and breathed on his disciples and said, receive the spirit. So Jesus's ascension and enthronement in heaven fulfill the divinic, Davidic kingdom promises. So not just was Jesus fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant, but also the Davidic covenant for the David's son to be on the throne forever. Five, the destruction of AD 70, Jerusalem, removed the old covenant permanently and fulfilled Hebrews 8, 13, which says that the old covenant was fading away, becoming obsolete and would soon disappear. It disappeared in any sense, but people have tried to bring it back. Now, even when Jesus came and preached the gospel and shared the good news and went into death and came back, people were still trying to get people to follow the law of Moses and Jesus at the same time. Total mixture of covenants, the Judaizers, they're called in Acts, and they tried to get people, particularly the Galatians and others, to follow the law of Moses. And Paul was somewhat horrified, and he, he wrote to the Galatians and said, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You started in grace. Why would you go back under the law? And why would we go back under the law, which we could not hope to fulfill? Because if you want to fulfill the law, you have to fulfill all of it. And there were 613, I think, different um, laws, ceremonial, civil, legal. And God does not want us to try and fulfill the law because it has already been removed through what Jesus did. So number six, between the cross and AD 70, there existed a 40 year period, a covenant transition for the church in which Jesus gave them a generation in which to leave the old covenant and Jerusalem figuratively so that they would not be stuck in Jerusalem when it got destroyed, as he prophesied it would do, recorded in Matthew 24 and Luke. Seven, during the transition period, the old covenant and the new covenant coexisted. And that is why there was this mixture why people didn't understand, the Gentiles didn't understand. Paul tried to preach the gospel of inclusion to show them they weren't under the law, but those from Jerusalem kept trying to bring them back under the law. And there was a lot of confusion during that period, which is why a lot of the letters were written to help them understand that difficult period. Number eight, the end of the age and the last days. And whenever you see that written, in the New Testament, it was the first century references to the last days of the Old Covenant and the end of the Old Covenant age. And just, she just described it as the birth pangs of the new. So the end of the old was the birth pangs of the new, not the end of the world. And age is not world, and often it's mistranslated as world, but it's actually the end of the age, the end of the Old Covenant age when that came to an end. Number nine, therefore no application of the Mosaic kingship vassal covenants, and covenant is a quite technical thing to understand. There were covenants made in, in the historical situations in history, um, but these covenants, none of them remain. So the feasts, the Sabbaths, the civil laws, the ceremonial laws, the moral laws are all done away with. We don't have to fulfill them or engage with them because Jesus has fulfilled all the implications of them. And actually, you know, if you if you understand what all the different feasts were, you can help and see where Jesus fulfilled them. But we're not to be involved. And even recently, I've seen lots and lots of posts online of people following Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement as if they have to in some way go back into a ceremonial situation 
to which Jesus has already been the one sacrifice for all time. We don't have to go in with a sacrifice every year, not even a living sacrifice, because that is once done for all time through Jesus. Number 10, the invitation of the new covenant is love one another as I have loved you. So the empowerment to love one another is not another law or a commandment to try and fulfill, but a goal that is fulfilled by God loving us and empowering us to love others, forgiving others, not holding anything against others. And Jesus taught a lot about how to deal with the relationships in that way. Here's another David Bentley Hart uh, quote. There is a rumor going around that I don't believe in hell. I very much do. I just believe in the version of it that you find in Origin and Isaac of Nineveh. And who's that guy? Yeah, Paul. Um, and ultimately, we need to go back to the early church to understand the concept of Gehenna, Hades, Sheol, Tartarus. There is no hell, but obviously that's the word that most people need to understand and what it means, what it doesn't mean, that actually they had a very different view from what the evangelical view has become. The Jewish view wasn't even, uh, they believed in a concept of hell where people were punished and tormented by demons forever and that type of thing. They didn't have that concept. They had a concept of ongoing purification after you died and eventually you'd end up into the relationship with God. Um, now, Paul, if this was such a, an important topic, you'd think he might have mentioned that in his epistles, but you actually don't find it at all which I think is an indication that this was not part of the message that he brought. He wasn't trying to frighten the Gentiles into believing in God through persuading them that if they didn't, they were going to end up being punished forever. So what if the lake of fire is the consuming fire of God's love, burning everything away that isn't the image of love? Only the image of God in us will be left. And I believe that is actually what it is. And it's a covenantal picture of consuming the old covenant so that the new covenant could be revealed. But you can also take it personally in that in my life, God's love, he is a consuming fire, will consume everything that's a hindrance to me fully understanding my origin and restoring first love to me. Who would have known that hell would be such a hot topic? Um, now, this is another one, Jeff Dole's, the judgment of God does not come to condemn us, but to correct us, not to trash us, but to transform us. It is never retributive, for God is love, and love is not retributive. But it is always restorative, for that is the way of love. Always looking to restore us back to our original origin, which is his desire and design for us. Every evangelical denomination teaches universalism. I do not know of one evangelical church that does not teach that all were included in the first Adam. They teach that there are absolutely no exceptions. Every human on the planet was included in the first Adam. That is universalism. Now, when it comes to the last Adam, they turn around and teach that what the last Adam did does not include all. You must accept that the last Adam did, you must accept what the last Adam did to be included. This, in effect, makes the first Adam greater and more powerful than the last Adam. Poor Jesus, even though he was God in the flesh, he could not, according to evangelicalism, equal the impact on all mankind that the first Adam did. And I think this is so important to understand. You know, in 1 Corinthians 15, it clearly says that all died in Adam and in the same verse, all will be made alive in Christ. All. Same all. But the all has changed its understanding within that evangelical gospel presentation. Sadly, a lot of people have believed that deception and live as if they're not included, but excluded. 
The biggest lie embraced by both Calvinism and Arminianism, but being debunked by the spirit of truth, is that man was born sinful with an Adamic nature and headed to hell. The problem actually is that man has lost the knowledge of his true identity as a son of God and therefore lives like an orphan or a slave. But that's not how God sees him or sees us. He sees us as sons and daughters and he loves and includes us. It's another quote this time by Don Keithley. Step back and take a spirit directed look and you will see just how heretical the evangelical church really is. But take heart, there is a new ecclesia emerging that gives Jesus his rightful place as saviour of the world, just as John revealed. Now, I want to just comment on that because I know in the zeal to reveal the sort of deception of many of the doctrines which the evangelical church believe, it can seem that people are having a go at evangelicals. I have many issues with evangelicalism, but not with evangelicals. Evangelicals are people who follow evangelicalism because they don't know anything different. I followed evangelicalism for most of my life. I was brought up in a Methodist and Brethren church. I followed that without question because that was the indoctrination that I received. I never questioned it. Now, I'm not against evangelism in sharing the good news, but I don't believe that the system of evan the, the evangelical system actually preaches good news. So my problem with evangelicalism is that it teaches separation and exclusion. So people I've been told that they cannot have a relationship with God because God cannot look upon them because of their condition, which they call sin. And that they're excluded him from what God has done until they do something to be included. And I believe that is a total misrepresentation of the gospel that Paul preached that was that they were already included. I have issue with the fact that evangelicalism teaches penal substitutionary atonement in which Jesus is saving us from an angry wrathful God. That again misrepresents and completely changes the very nature of what Jesus came to do. I have a problem in that it teaches infernalism, hell, eternal hell and eternal conscious torment. I, I have a real problem that that is the essence of what is being preached to try and get people to accept a loving God who would send his children to an eternal tormented situation. I believe that perverts God's character and nature away from unconditional love, which is why I have a, a huge problem with it. And when God deconstructed me and changed and removed the pillars that held up my belief system, and he showed me nine of them, the very first one that he deconstructed was evangelicalism. Now, at that point, you know, most people just think of evangelicalism is, well, they believe in preaching the gospel. Well, they do. But is it the same gospel that Paul preached or that God wants us to preach? That is the issue. So I have a problem that it makes God's love conditional on us. In other words, God doesn't love us until we repent or confess or do whatever we need to do according to whatever system we're told to do it by. So therefore it preaches a gospel of works, not grace, which is not good news because no one can work for it or earn it by whatever we do, because it's already free through grace by faith, which even, even our faith to believe it, it's the faith that God gives us so that we can believe it. Evangelicalism teaches the need to repent and believe to be saved. Now, that would be absolutely foundation to that. That is the gospel message. You need to repent and believe to be saved. No, we're already saved by what Jesus did. He came to save the world. We didn't need to do anything. He finished the work. We just need to come to accept what he's already done 
not do something to make it real for us. And that is the problem in preaching. You need to repent and you need to believe to be saved because people never really sure whether their repentance or belief is actually good enough to save them. And it creates doubt, fear, unbelief. And I had that for a lot of my early life in terms of teenage years. Even though I prayed a prayer asking God to forgive me and whatever, I never was sure that I'd actually done it good enough or that God had really heard it or really actually accepted that. So I doubted. And whenever someone preached a good message, as I would see it in those days, I would respond again, praying another prayer. Because I wasn't sure that the first one or the second one or the third one that I'd preached or had response to the preaching had been accepted by God. Now, when you have an experience of unconditional love and you know God loves you unconditionally, you have a testimony which is absolutely rock solid and the foundation on which our life can be built. Evangelicalism makes salvation about being saved from God's punishment and going to heaven rather than living a life of freedom and the fullness of that salvation is the word sozo, freedom from all of the things that could be affecting our lives now, not having to wait. And every time you read the word saved in the New Testament, you've got to ask yourself, what do I think that means? What is its context? And am I conditioned to immediately think that that means I'm being saved from punishment and I'm going to go to heaven? Because actually, sometimes it means being saved physically. Sometimes it does mean being saved spiritually, but it's a already saved spiritually so that we can enter into it. And therefore, believing it is something that comes about when we've realized what has happened, not by doing something to make that so for us in our lives. Now, of course, God so wants us to know his love that he will use any opportunity to help us come to that realization. So if we pray a prayer and say we've repented and ask him to forgive us and ask Jesus to come into our life, of course, something will happen in that process, but it didn't make it happen. It had already happened. It just helped us to come into an experience of what had already happened. Now, evangelicalism, in my view, twists Bible translations through confirmation bias. In other words, people translate or interpret what the Bible says through what they already believe. And most modern translations of the Bible are translated by evangelicals, and therefore they have a perception about what things mean. So I believe a lot of Bible words and a lot of Bible concepts are twisted to affirm futurism, that Jesus is coming again at the end of the world, hell, that we're going to be sent into an eternal conscious torment if we don't accept and repent, penal substitution atonement, repentance, original sin. So many words are mistranslated from what their original Greek meaning is to bring it into this is what it currently means. And when you read a commentary or you read a concordance, like Strong's Concordance, usually what it says is properly, which means this is what it actually means. And then it sort of gives you a lot of other meanings, which are actually meanings that have been drawn from a perception of what it means to help so-called people understand it. But actually, that isn't true. And part of the problem is that that then changes what it actually says and makes it harder and more confusing. I have a problem with it because it teaches sola scriptura. In other words, Bible alone. Therefore, that hinders us in potentially receiving fresh and progressive revelation today because we can only receive it through what was written 2,000 years ago or before in a different context to different people. And we're expected to hear God speak to us through the Bible when God wants to speak to us directly. Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice. He didn't say, my sheep will read my book. And we have turned everything around 
the Bible. So it teaches about God theology from studying the Bible rather than through personal encounters with God ourselves, which is actually what most people wrote about when they wrote the things that are included in what we call the Bible, which is a collection of books written by different people right throughout the ages who have written poetry, they've written different forms, they've written apocalyptical language, they've written all sorts of different ways. And they're all included in what we call the Bible, but was what they were writing actually designed for us? Or does God speak to every generation through Jesus, which may include some writings that people write? And we need to be very clear on who do we know what do we know about God? Is it personal or is it a theological position that we have been told through someone preaching what they say the Bible says? You know, and God spoke to me, you know, at one point when he when he was taking me through deconstruction and he asked me the question, you know, how much of what you know about me, what you know about the Bible, what you know about Christianity has come directly through me and how much has come through the preaching and readings and writings of other people. And I had to be honest and say, a lot of what I thought was true was because I had been taught that that was true. Some things that I actually studied myself, but because I was conditioned by evangelical thinking, I came to the same conclusion that the people that were telling me this was true did as well. And it wasn't until God broke into my life through baptizing me in the spirit so that I could experience the fullness of God's spirit in me, the spirit of truth, that he began to be able to speak to me to show me that those things that I thought were true actually weren't all true. And that process has continued uh, since 1986. I believe that evangelicalism teaches that everything in the Bible applies to us today without recognizing the context and the audience relevance. In other words, every word that Jesus said, the red letters in some Bible, well, it all applies to today. Well, actually, I'm telling you, it does not, because sometimes Jesus was speaking in the context of those who were still living under the old covenant, and he was trying to help them understand the failure of the old covenant so that they would follow him. And Jesus himself said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you will find eternal life, and yet you don't come to me. And even his disciples, when Jesus asked them, um, you know, are you going to leave me? When he gave a really difficult teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, which was very difficult for Jewish people to accept because they weren't allowed to eat blood, things with blood. What was the truth in that was you have not come to me. And actually they said, well, where else can we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. They recognized that their scriptures did not have the key to eternal life that was found in Jesus. And it's really important that we understand that and we pursue a relationship with God through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, for him to speak to us directly and to reveal the truth to us so we can experience it for ourselves. That will help us understand what first love is, who we are in that relationship. I have a problem with evangelicalism because it teaches futurist eschatology, millennialism and Zionism. That problem, which is all rooted in brethren teaching from the 1820s, 30s, basically puts off most of what is ours today to a future time. And actually, all of being an inheritor of the promises of God and, in a sense, uh, having the fullness of sonship today and the responsibility that comes for creation is ours today. Anything that puts it off to the future robs us of present expectation. And again, certain words which are translated coming of Jesus, that we will have this at Jesus's coming, actually truly mean at, in Jesus's presence in which we already are in. So there are many things that teach 
Well, the church is the heavenly people of God and we're all going to be rescued. And the, in that rescue, then on earth, there's an earthly people. They'll inherit the earth. And those people are seen as people who follow Judaism or Jewish people. And they will reign with Christ on earth for a thousand years. All of that. Now, I believe that teaching, again, completely removes the position that God has given us as his people to be the light to the world and to bring about the restoration of all things and places something on another group of people who are going to come through religion that Jesus already demonstrated that the old covenant was not how they could enter into a relationship with him so this teaching completely separates us from the present reality of what the holy spirit wants to bring us into as sons of god and places it into the future or onto another group rather than on us as his children and i believe it teaches that it is and always has been the orthodox theological position yeah, when I was starting to explore um, being deconstructed and when God started to challenge my beliefs, someone uh, who was sort of um, struggling with that said to me, you were on a slippery slope away from orthodoxy. You know, and I replied, yep, and I'm skiing it as fast as I can down that slope because your view of orthodoxy and that theological position is not what the early church had the early church were not evangelical from today's evangelical perspective and if you read the early church and the father early church writings and those that have put them together into sort of a something we can read today you'll find that that is absolutely the truth they didn't believe on many of the things because evangelicalism has only been around a few hundred years it is not the position they held in the early church it's just what the evangelical system says because they say this is orthodoxy and it's always been orthodoxy the reality is no it hasn't now why i'm majoring on this is because it is a huge deception that has actually stopped us entering into the fullness of who we are by bringing this into a position that has robbed us of our true identity and god wants to restore us so we're talking about restoring first love and finding our origin in him therefore we need to come back to the truth of following jesus in relationship and not following a system of belief whether that be christianity as a religious belief system because jesus didn't come to set, start a new religion and Christianity is actually not Judaism plus Jesus, totally two different systems. And both systems are wrong. From Jesus's perspective, Jesus came to establish a relationship with his people who would follow him into a relationship with the Father and experience their true identity, which is so, so important. So that changes why we're here and what we feel is why we're here and there's this great meme um, that i found we didn't come here to fear the future we came here to shape it and god wants us to shape the future as history makers who will establish god's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven to outwork heaven on earth to bring about the transformation and the restoration of all things back to god's original condition we're not need to fear the future we don't need to be stuck in these belief systems that rob us of our authority and our position in sonship we need to shape the future and another one was the creator created you to create because we're made in god's image and likeness to be creative don't let anything rob your creativity and keep you in a lesser kind of life living in lost identity because we can be christians and still live in lost identity and i sadly i lived in a lot of lost identity for a lot of my life until god began to unveil and reveal 
and bring me into a restored state by deconstructing my beliefs and renewing my mind from my relationship with him. The perichoresis of being in him, of being in that relationship and truly experiencing the reality of what that relationship is. Okay, well, let's get back to restoring first love and our true identity and origin. And as we begin to embrace that true origin is in God and not our earthly parents, we will discover the deeper truth about who we are as sons of God and our role as sons in creation itself. Now, as I've been sharing, my process of transformation followed the marriage process of intimacy with God linked to the four chambers of the heart. And this was what God used to bring about this change in me. Now, I'm looking from now back at what happened. While I was going through it, I was not really understanding what I do now, but I kept walking the relationship out. So there is the Laka, the Sagula, the Ketuba, the Mikvah and the Hoopa, and the garden, the dance floor, the soaking room, and the bridal chamber. And they were all very life-changing experiences that God took me through. And we've looked at the gardens of Laka that showed me how much God, who is father, son, spirit, slash mother, because I believe they're family, loved me and desired a deeper relationship with me, restoring me to realize I am and have always been part of God's family with an eternal heritage. I just didn't know that. And then when I got to know God, I didn't know what that really meant. I was still trying to perform for it. So my journey to experience first love involved understanding my inner self, knowing myself and understanding the things that had affected me and eventually knowing my innermost being, the core of my being, spirit, soul, body, and union, and my true identity as a son of God, and all that that means. There were many experiences and encounters I had with God within me and in the heavenly realms that were very significant to this process, and that all of us can enter in on the journey that is unique and individual for each of us. And the Father desired to reveal to me my sonship, my identity, but there was only so much truth that I could handle in the beginning. And he took me on a journey so that he opened up things for me. That's why the dance floor was so significant for me, because on the dance floor, he danced with me to bring illumination and mystery, which unveiled and prepared me for the future and what was coming. Progressively revealing my true identity and my origin from my scroll, which was the desire that he had for me as a son. Now, I touched on this last time, but I'm going to go into it a little bit more. In contradiction to unconditional love, I've heard that some people teach that God has plans for us that include all the bad things that happen to us in our lives. That would include sickness, pain, abuse, trauma, sorrow, even death itself. And that these things we agree to and that they therefore we can't do anything about it. Now, some would say that we've accepted a scroll that included all those negative things before coming to earth. Therefore, we must accept that all that has happened in our lives, good and bad, as God's will. Now, I believe God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. There is no bad. Therefore, how could God want us to have bad things to happen to us if God is good? And God is love. He can't and he won't. So I do not believe that God our Father ever intended anything bad to happen in our lives. But when it does, he does seek to bring good out of it. But that doesn't mean that he intended it. And sometimes we can interpret the good that comes out of it that this must have been what God wanted in the first place. God is a good Father who only wants the best for his children. So therefore, all God's thoughts and all his intentions about us are good. It is a hyper-Calvinistic fate to believe that God is sovereign and therefore everything that happens must be his will. And we've got to step out of that God has a perfect will for everything and there's only one way for anything to happen that removes any part we have to play in it. 
And God wants to reveal who we are as his co-heirs in all this so we can cooperate with him in it and not just sit back and let it happen to us. If God's plan for us is good, what does it include? Well, I believe relationship is the key component of any plan God has for us because he desires relationship to be the foundation of everything. He has made us so that we can be in intimate face-to-face -face relationship with him so we can prosper and succeed as his children. He does not want us to fail. He wants us to be free to be us. Now, immediately I talk about succeeding you may get the view of well that means there's a whole lot of things that he wants me to do and i've got to succeed and i've got to do them really well that's not what it's about he wants us to be who he made us to be and everything can outflow from that he's not got a list of things that he's ticking off that we do and a whole lot of other things he ticks off that we don't do so that we feel guilt shame and condemnation because we're not good enough god wants us to feel how he feels about us and to know how he feels about us now there's a a bible verse that is often used when we come to talk about god's plans and it's in jeremiah 29 11. for i know the plans that i have for you declares the lord plans for prosperity and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Now I've heard that preached and I've heard that preached and every time I've heard that preached, it was never in the context in which it was written. Now I believe the Holy Spirit can absolutely speak to us and declare that God has plans for us and God only has pl plans for our prosperity. Absolutely, that is true. But the context here is Israel in exile. They were in exile and Jeremiah prophesied that God was going to restore them from exile. But that is not the full story of the plan. That is just a beginning of a plan that was to bring them and not just them, but the whole world into a restored relationship with God. So God's plans to restore Israel were never to be fulfilled just for them. And I think. We've got to understand that and understand the context of what these verses say so that we can understand fully God's plans and purposes for us today. Otherwise, we will get into, ah, well, they failed. It didn't work. Look at look at now. Look at the problems that are going on now and all of this stuff. So the covenant made with Abraham was never limited to Israel as an ethnic or religious group or to a piece of land in the Middle East. See, Hebrews 11, 8, the whole record of 11 is about those who were walking by faith, but not foreseeing the fulfillment of all the promises. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for inheritance. For he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham had a more clear revelation of what God was looking to do because God had spoken to Abraham to tell Abraham that he was going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth or the gospel was going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth and God spoke that to Abraham so Abraham's vision was never for well we're going to have a piece of land and we're going to have it forever that was never his intention. And it goes on in Hebrews 11, verse 16 to say, but as it is, they desired a better country. That is a heavenly one. Now that's not talking about heaven, but about heaven manifesting on earth. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now that city is the new Jerusalem, but effectively is us. That's what Abraham was looking for. He was looking afar off to what was coming. He wasn't looking for a piece of land that they were going to fight over forever. God's covenant with Abraham was fulfilled not in Israel, 
but in Abraham's seed. And that seed was Jesus, not seeds or plural, but in seed as in Jesus. And that is very clearly spelt out. Now, when God spoke to Abraham, it's recorded in Genesis 12, 2. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and make your grain great and you shall be a blessing. And it goes on to say, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This was the message. That was never meant to be restricted. To one group, one people or one piece of land, they were always supposed to be an example so that others could enter into the relationship that they had with God. But they rejected the intimacy of a relationship with God when they refused to come up to, into the mountain in the fire and the smoke and receive God's presence and fire to purify them and bring them into that relationship. They sent Moses and they set up a whole system of various things that were designed to help them maintain their relationship with God, which was actually only through Moses or through a mediator. So the message that God gave Abraham was never meant to be just for his children, as in ethnic children, but who they would reach. And this is because it came through Jesus. So the gospel was always for the whole world. So God did not fail with Israel. They just failed to be the light of the world that he asked them to be. Jesus came as the light of the world and he called his disciples and hence us to be the light of the world. To actually demonstrate what it's like to have a relationship of intimacy with God as our father. And yet look at all the religions around and all of what Christianity is presented and how much of it is really the light of the world and how much of it is truly representing the true gospel that Jesus came to bring the good news so the gospel that was all the families of the earth would be blessed that was the gospel in fact Galatians 3 8 says this the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are the faith of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. And of course, all of us have been gifted that faith. So we've all been blessed, empowered to prosper through the seed of Abraham, who actually is Jesus. So the gospel was preached. This is the true gospel, but it would be for the whole world. No restriction, no limitations, no limited atonement not just for those who chose it but for everyone galatians 3 16 says this now the promises were spoken to abraham and to his seed and does not say and to seeds as one would in referring to many but rather as in referring to one and your seed that is christ so god so loved the world that he sent jesus and jesus came so the world would not remain in its lost state. And the word perish in John 3.16 has been actually wrongly translated from the word lost. Because the word perish to an evangelical means you're going to go to hell. Whereas the means lost just means you're lost. And that means living in lost identity. And Jesus came to seek and to save the lost as the good shepherd who would find the sheep who were lost. Now, Romans 4.13 describes the promise to Abraham. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So it was never going to come through a religious system and we are Abraham's descendants, not ethnic descendants, not religious descendants, but descendants because we are in Christ and Christ is the seed of Abraham. 
Galatians 3.28 spells that out. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you all are all one in Christ. That includes all the Jews and all the Greeks. In other words, all the Gentiles. So that includes everybody. And all who are slave or all who are free and all who are male and all who are female. So you don't leave anyone out there. You're all one in Christ. Now, how did we become one in Christ? Because he made us one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, and that is, if is not a, oh, well, you might not, but actually it's just a statement. You belong to Christ. You are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Those who belong to Christ, which is the whole world that he came to save, because we're all included in Christ, and God gave Jesus all into his hands we're all descendants and we're all heirs of the promise this is why it's so important that we do not get deceived into believing there's another people who actually are the heirs of this promise we are and the gospel is the good news for the world not a restricted thing so god's plans for his people were never limited to a small piece of land in the middle east because Abraham's inheritance was always to be the world. And he knew that. All the families of the earth will be blessed. So Jesus, as the seed of Abraham, took away the sin of the world. The lost identity of the world. God fulfilled all his promises and all the covenants in Jesus. And therefore, for us, in him, in the new covenant, which he made with the Father and included the world in it. Because he's reconciled the world. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not holding any of their trespasses against them. 2 Corinthians 5.19 So there's only ever been one people of God, those of faith. They would be inheritors of the promises. And now those who were not his people, according to Peter, are now his people. And Paul describes that as the one new man included in Christ, the world. Jesus took away the sin of the world so that all would know they're included in all God's promises and plans. And God gifts his faith to all so all are able to believe what is already true. Their belief doesn't make it true. It is already true. They just come to accept what is already true and enter into the fullness of that are we living in the fullness or are we thinking that some of this doesn't apply to us and that is the problem with futurism and zionism it places the promises of god to different groups of people rather than one group of people who are included in christ so god is love and god is good so our scroll of destiny reflects that truth so that we can be like him who's our dad god created us his children in his image and in his likeness with a mandate of sonship to be fruitful to multiply to increase to subdue to rule in creation as sons and he wants to restore us back to that true identity and he wants us to know it by personal experience and not just theological belief systems because that is the problem. Jesus didn't come to set up another belief system. He came to introduce us into a relationship with the Father and the Spirit. So what is our scroll? Now, I believe we can sort of get caught up too much in, is there a book I need to go and read? Um, you know, do I, how do I get to see it? And I was like that in the early days when I realized there was a scroll or a book written about me. I wanted to know what was in it. I was trying to find it. I was looking for it in heaven. You know, I was pursuing it because I'd heard someone teach on it and I was like, wow, there's a scroll. I can go and find out about my life. Actually, our scroll is the record of who we are created to be. It is our real authentic self. The scroll of destiny reveals our true identity and how we can outwork God's desires and intentions in relationship with him. The scroll of our life is the record of what we do as sons. It's not the record of our lost identity before we came to a realization of sonship. All of that is nailed to the cross. 
but is as sons how is our life gone and it's really important that we think about that because the way we view it can hinder us from going forward now psalm 40 verse 7 is david talking and in verse 6 it says you have opened my ears so in other words god spoke to him and he spoke to him and then david said behold i've come it is written of me in the scroll of the book i delight to do your will my god your law is within my heart now this was later to be declared by the prophets isaiah and jeremiah and ezekiel who hearing god speak to them began to declare a new covenant in which a heart of stone would be removed and a heart of flesh would be given all of this understanding of relationship we have with god today david had this revelation now commentators would say that david was prophetically saying that this was his son who was to come and we would say that was jesus now yes jesus also said this as it's written also in other places that this was something that jesus understood that he had a scroll or book that was written of him in which of course jesus only came to outwork the father's heart and desires and he had a heart relationship with god but look at verse six in the context of verse seven and it says this and this is the revelation that david received you have not desired sacrifice and meal offerings you've opened my ears you've not required burnt offering and the sin offering so here's the whole system that they'd set up and david had a revelation directly from god that that was not something god was looking for and then prophetically declared that david himself but also jesus to come effectively there was a outworking of something written in a scroll that would enable him to outwork god's heart now in acts it absolutely describes david as a man after god's own heart which i think is a fulfillment of this in spite of all the things david may have done which totally contradict that god looks at it through grace and through his intention and it also says that david served the purpose of god in his generation and i believe that is what god is looking for us to serve the purpose of god in our generation out of relationship being a son not as a slave but being a son revelation 5 1 says this i saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals now the book of revelation is written from the perspective of the end of the old covenant and the beginning of the new so when i read this of course the holy spirit can show me hey you've got a scroll of your life which is written inside and on the back and and sealed up but then it also says that who is worthy to unlock the scroll or break the seals and of course it says jesus and when i went and sat on the father's lap and i was engaged with him on the throne of grace and he asked me do you want to see your scroll i of course said absolutely yes i do and when the spirit of the fear of the lord one of the seven spirits of god came to me with a scroll it appeared to be sealed front you know with seven seals and i immediately thought of this and then the, the spirit of the fear of the lord took me into the judgment seat where those seals were figuratively broken and i realized that the scroll was not sealed up and therefore who i was could be revealed but the scroll of my life probably didn't reflect the scroll of my destiny so i applied this and god applied it to my own life but in reality the old covenant law is what kept the scroll sealed up until jesus came to overcome the condemnation of the law so that the fullness of god's intention would not be limited in their understanding to israel as they knew it and the disciples were still looking for the kingdom to be restored to israel and that concept and even even after jesus came 
to them and breathed onto them and the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost, they still were not preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. They still thought it was only going to be to them until another vision comes out of heaven, you know, eat this, you know, unclean animals. And then the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and they realized, well, we have been keeping this, but they still were caught up in the mixture of the law of Moses and what they should keep and what they shouldn't keep and all of that stuff, which was so restricting the truth of them being the light to the world. So we can, of course, see this as symbolic of our individual scroll that can be opened, but also of God's plans and purposes that were sealed up for mankind and were opened when Jesus came, overcame our covenantal death and he removed the seals to establish the new covenant to which God's plans and purposes are unveiled in a new relationship in sonship for us to discover. So the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus. It's not the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus who came again to pronounce God's judgment on the old covenant system, bring it to an end, as he prophesied he would do in Matthew 24. When the temple, their heaven and earth would be finally destroyed, the birth pangs of the end of the old was the beginning of the new. All that took place and the book of Revelation describes that. Now, I'm going to read you from the uh, Mirror Bible what Francois de Troyes says about the book of Revelation. And it's in the preface of that book. It says, the language of the book of Revelation is purely symbolic. Its rich imagery celebrates the champion of the ages, the slain and risen Lamb of God, bringing closure to every definition of judgment in his death and resurrection. Throughout the unfolding conversation, <clears throat> pictures come to mind that have already been part of the narrative of God's prophetic dealings with Israel for generations, symbolically pointing to a person and a moment recorded historically in time where the resolve of God concludes powerfully in the glorious triumph of the Lamb over every definition of devil. In fact, every possible idea of sin, judgment, death, Hades, Satan, devil, demon, dragon, beast, false prophet, is addressed and dissolved and thus rendered redundant. And that is the power of the end of the old and the full release of the new to bring us into the revelation that we now can live as sons of God in the power of who we really are, to have the origin in God restored. So old covenant Israel, who rejected marriage and intimacy for religion and independence, is a symbol of all humanity living in lost identity, working for religious acceptance through various forms of sacrifices and offerings, whatever they are. Jesus came to remove the lost identity of the world to enable all to discover their true identity as sons of God and revealed to us who we really are. Now, I love Psalm 139 because I believe it's, it's a revelation of how God thinks about us and he wants us to understand. And it's again written from a place, I believe, of revelation. For you created my innermost parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. So he must have had a revelation or his soul did to know that this was true. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully formed in the depths of the earth. Now, very figurative language. Your eyes have seen my formless substance and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there were none of them. So all this was done before the foundation of the world. How precious are your thoughts for me, God? How vast is the sum of them? Were I to count them, they would outnumber the sand. That is what we need to have restored to us to know the truth of who we really are. As David had to him when he wrote that. 
Um, Paul declares something similar, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. These good works are not works to earn God's favour and blessing, but are actions that reflect love, loving others as we have been loved. Those good works are in perfect alignment with how we're made, i.e. our identity as sons of God. They are opportunities for us to be the real us as God intended. Our outworking reflects our God intended identity and redemptive gift, how he wired us to be and mirror his heart and his unconditional love. Now, I believe when we begin to start to embrace this, we will start to see things around us that the Father is doing aligned to our scroll and our identity. I don't believe the Father will show us things that are aligned to other people. We may get a bigger picture of certain things, but we should not try and be like other people or do what other people are doing or trying to be like somebody else. We need to discover who we are and be an outworking of that. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing, and that's what as sons we're designed to do. That is why when we find total fulfillment, when we're at completely at rest, our scroll is not filled with a list of prescriptive good works, but is a revelation of who we are and how we've been made, including our identity and redemptive gift. And when we begin to understand it, we will be able to interact with other people and the world and creation itself from in a completely different way. Our scroll is a revelation of the Father's hearts and desires so we can cooperate with him in union, in relationship. Our scroll of destiny is not a guarantee, but an opportunity to cooperate with the Father as a son. Now, we may all have missed opportunities and probably had some mixed motives in a lot of the things we did. I certainly did. That's why God had to take me into the soaking room, take me into the dark cloud, take me onto the fire of the altar, take me into the fiery river on the fire stones to bring about the purification and refinement of my life to transform me, to metamorphose me back into who he wanted me ought to be from the creation, from the foundation of the world. Now, the father does not wait for a fictitious judgment at the end of the time to declare the verdict of innocence over us. There's an opportunity for ongoing judgment of our scroll at the judgment seat, which means our life can engage his mercy so that he can pronounce us justified and righteous. Therefore, anything in our lives which is not in alignment with who we really are does not become a stumbling block through guilt, shame, condemnation. And the enemy, the accuser, will always accuse us to try and stop us fulfilling who we really are because we won't feel worthy and won't feel good enough and won't feel accepted. And then we'll end up in a state which will bring us back to our lost identity. So the judgment seat is where God's mercy and our innocence can be established to remove all possible self-inflicted guilt, shame, condemnation from us so that the enemy cannot use them as accusations against us. The Father does not want to us to exclude ourselves as sons. And I would encourage you to think about, are there things that have happened in your life or even maybe currently in your life that potentially the enemy could accuse you of that would make you exclude yourself and bring upon you any feelings of guilt, shame and condemnation, because the Holy Spirit does not do that. The Holy Spirit will convict us of who we really are so that we can be transformed and metamorphosed into that reality. Paul described the judgment seat, 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will be become evident for the day will show it because it is revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each one's work. So our life, our scroll, the outworking of our sonship will be tested by fire. Now, that's nothing to be afraid of. 
it is something to be embraced and to be proactively sought. The scroll of our life is a record of the outworking of our new creation in Christ. It's not a record of our lost identity. The wood, hay and straw are the things we may have done with mixed motives or the things we may have not seen or missed in our lives. But there is no condemnation from God. As we embrace God's judgment, a verdict, at the judgment seat, the fire of God's love continually purifies our scroll so gold, silver and precious stones can shine with the glory of our true identity as sons. Our strolls can train God's desire for our immortality, not our death. So we need to embrace life and not be accused and come under the accusation. Now, I'm going to leave it there. And I've got a lot more I want to say around this whole subject and also going on into how we enter into this. But there are many scrolls in heaven that we can engage. And there are many ways of engaging the scroll of our destiny. But God has designed them all to help us come into the revelation and truth of who we really are. And you'll find if you engage heaven that you'll probably find scrolls. If you do find them and you come across them, wherever you may come across them, I'd encourage you to eat them figuratively. And you may do it literally, which is what I did. And some people take them and place them in their belly. Ezekiel 3, 1 says, Then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. Revelation 10, 10. The, uh, I took the little scroll from the angel's hands and ate it. And in my mouth, it was sweet as honey. Now it goes on to say in my belly, it was bitter. Because some of the things that we receive need to bring about change in our lives and change is not always easy but i encourage you to be open to engage scrolls so that those scrolls can be a revelation of the truth of who you really are and so you can truly embrace it and ultimately our destiny is inherently tied up with who we are and as we learn to be we will find that we have done things aligned with our identity. When we choose to line up with God's purposes and seek to be guided by him, we'll start to fulfill our destiny. It will be an outworking of us being ourselves, a state of being who we are. I had many encounters within the heart of God and within that relationship of I am that were so deeply transformational. Um, discovering my true nature the my true essence the nature of god his relational love for me my own identity and you know i encourage you as we go into encounter ask jesus to take you to engage the father's heart ask jesus to engage you with scrolls as you engage the father as he dances with you on the dance floor be open for him to lead you direct you go where he leads you you know, don't necessarily think you have to follow an activation or where I might think you can go. Be open to wherever the Father wants you to go so you can experience what the Father wants you to experience today. You could experience first love. Now, to do that, as we've said each time, abandon your soul. Abandon yourself into the trust of God who loves you unconditionally. Get out of that boat, that place of security within your own self, where you can then sink in the vast ocean of God's unconditional love and embrace it. Again, I encourage you to close your eyes, get comfortable, relax, set your thinking on Jesus, on the Father. It may help to start focusing on your breathing and slowing down Breathe in slowly, deeply, hold it, and then breathe out. And as you do so, focus on breathing in the breath of God, the love of God. And as you breathe out, you have more capacity to breathe in again. 
So breathe in and breathe out. Receive God's unconditional love. Let the Father love on you. Let him show you how much he loves you. Come to that place of rest and be still. Now, people often say, how do I feel God's love? That's individual for everyone. You may feel right now comforted. You may feel warm. You may feel a sensation. You just may feel God's presence. God may tell you he loves you. God may affirm you as his child. Love is different for each of us, but it's something God wants you to know by experience. So just rest and let him speak to you, touch you, affirm you, bless you. choice. You can make a choice and in making a choice, figuratively, you can step out of the boat, you can step into the ocean of unconditional love, you can sink and trust God to bless you, to heal you, to restore you, make you whole but you make that choice and you show by that choice what you choose to do whether it's getting out of the boat whether it's picturing a door and opening it whatever it is you just make that decision you're going to choose to surrender so that you can experience something more of God's unconditional love.
a safe place. I believe the Father wants to meet you face to face. Father wants to engage with you, hug you, embrace you, show you how much he loves you. So you can receive that life. So you can breathe easily again. You can be refreshed with his presence. So I encourage you just to think of a door open up the desire of your heart to engage with God face to face as you let those thoughts of a door form in your imagination as you picture that door that door is in your spirit choose to open the door you're inviting the presence of Father, Son and Spirit to come in and fill you. You can choose to open that door and in opening the door, invite the Father in that he might hug you, embrace you, touch your life, bring wholeness to you, speak to you, reveal himself to you, tell you how much he loves you. And as he embraces you, as you're heart to heart with him, you may hear some of the vast, some of the thoughts he has about you that can restore you and bring you into wholeness. Father's embrace. Be open for the Father to take you onto the dance floor or into the garden to dance with you, to entwine with you, to bring you revelation and mystery. Perhaps the Father would want to take you to the judgment seat to open the scroll of your life to purify, refine your life as a son, removing all guilt, shame, condemnation. If you're carrying any of those negative emotions, feelings, thoughts, just let the Father's love, mercy and grace wash it all away cleanse you in the fire of his love. Purify your heart. If you know of anything, just hand it over to him, let it go. Let the fire purify it. It's his love. He loves you. He desires you to prosper and to succeed. 
He has plans for your life, for you to be fully you. Just go wherever the Father leads you. Feel free to stay in that place of intimacy. Don't rush if you feel you want to stay there. If you're in the middle of something, feel free to embrace that. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe. It really does help. Thank you very much.